Hello everyone. Moving on towards the next epidemiological study that is analytical epidemiology from general epidemiology. Now in the last video we have seen about the classification of this epidemiological study. So it is basically classified into two that is observational and experimental. Now in observational now as the name says it is to observe. So in observational you have two that is descriptive and analytical. So we have seen about the descriptive in the last video already. Now we will see about the analytical epidemiology in depth in this video. So what is analytical epidemiology? So it is a second major type of epidemiological study. So first one was your descriptive. So this is a second major type. Now in this the subject of interest is the individual or a small group of individual in contrast to the descriptive study where researcher he deals with a large population. Now we have seen about this in the descriptive that we are dealing with a larger population that we are studying larger population over there. But in this analytical we are seeing only a small group of people. Now the objective in this analytical is not to formulate a hypothesis instead it is to test the hypothesis. So in descriptive we have seen that the last step was to formulate a hypothesis. What is hypothesis? Hypothesis is nothing but a supposition. So for example we are supposing that like smoking it can cause oral cancer but you don't know whether it is true or false. You need to so you have just given a hypothesis that yes smoking can cause cancer. But now in this analytical what you are going to do is you are going to test this hypothesis whether that statement that you have given is right or wrong. So in this the inference is to the population. So now what are the two types of analytical? So it is case control and cohort study. So from each of this study design one can determine whether or not a statistical association exists between a disease and a suspected factor. So in the example we have said that smoking causes cancer. So what is your factor? It is smoking. So what it is causing? Cancer. So because of this analytical epidemiology we can see whether like truly smoking is causing cancer or not and if smoking is causing cancer then how is the strength of that association like how severe it can affect someone. So we are going to see about this case control and cohort like in this video. Starting with the first that is the case control study. So it is a first form and approach to test the causal hypothesis. Now the hypothesis that we have given was smoking it causes cancer. So the cause is your smoking. So over here now you can test this hypothesis that yes whether smoking is causing cancer or not. So it is increasingly used to know the causes of the disease. So case control is used to see the cause of the disease. Now what are the other name for this case control? So it is also called as case referent retrospective or trohawk study. So trohawk is nothing but when you are spelling the cohort in the backward direction. So it is T R O H O C. So you will see from the backward direction it will become cohort C O H O R T. So as it is opposite of cohort so because of that it is known as trohawk study. Now what are the distinct features of this case control? So in this both the exposure and the outcome they have occurred before the onset of the study. So before starting this case control study in this the person he has already developed with the disease. So exposure is nothing but your causative factor and outcome is your disease. So in this case control you see that the disease has already occurred in that person. Now over here the study it proceeds backward from effect to cause and because of that it is known as retrospective because you are going in the backward direction that is from the disease to the cause. So effect is your disease. So now now for example if a patient is having oral cancer so from that you will see what is the cause of that oral cancer. So you are going in the backward direction. Now over here what you do is you use a control or a comparison group to support an inference. So this is a distinctive feature that you use. So case is your like the person who is having the disease and control are the one who is not having the disease. So in this study you use a control or a comparison group to support your inference. So now how is the basic study design? Now as this is a case control so now we have already seen that we are going from the effect to cause. So over here now we are going to select the cases and control from the population. Cases are the ones who are having the disease and controls are the people without the disease. So now you have selected the cases and the control from the population. So cases are the one for example who is having oral cancer and control are the ones who are not having the oral cancer. So now in this there are two scenarios like the person who is having the disease is exposed to any risk factor or he is not exposed to any risk factor. So risk factor can be with like the person he is a tobacco chewer. So because of that so as he is a tobacco chewer because of that only he got this oral cancer and there are cases where the person he is not having any risk factor that is he is not a tobacco chewer but still he develops with the disease. So it can be because of various other factors also. Now the next is the control. So the control are the ones who is not having the disease again they have two scenarios in this. So it is exposed and non-exposed. 
So over here, exposed are the ones to the person who is a tobacco chewer and still he does not develop the disease. And non-exposed are the ones who is not a tobacco chewer and he is not developing the disease. So over here, now you're going from the disease to the cause. So this is a basic study design for the case control study. Now, what are the basic steps in the case control study? So first, you're going to select the cases under control. Then you're going to match them. Then you're going to see the measurement of the exposure. And finally, you're going to analyze and you're going to interpret your study. So the first step is selection of case and control. So what is the case? Case is the one, the person who's already having the disease and controls are the one who's not having the disease. So now, how are you going to select the cases? So the cases, they're selected depending on two criteria. That is diagnostic criteria. And eligibility criteria so in diagnostic criteria you have to see that like you're specifying about the disease and about the stage of the disease like how severe the disease is so you're going to specify about that in your diagnostic criteria so now for example if you're taking the case of cancer so now in that the cancer it should be histologically same for all the people so that becomes your diagnostic criteria that it is histologically same and eligibility criteria it is the second criteria in which the person he is eligible for the study or not. So in that you have to see that the cases that you are taking. So you are selecting the cases who are new. So you are not going to select the people who already have the disease from a longer time. So you are going to select only the people who have just developed that disease. So that becomes your eligibility criteria that the patient or the person he is eligible to come for your case control study. Now, what are the sources like from where can you get these cases? So you can get the sources from hospital. So you can get your cases from hospitals or from the general population. So this is about the case like from where you can get your case and what are the criteria for selecting the case that is your person who's already having the disease. Now, what is a control? So control, it is the person who is not having the disease. Now, it is a crucial step in the case control study that you have to select the controls. So the control, they must be free from the disease under study. So control are the ones who is not having the disease. Then they must be similar to the cases except for the absence of the disease. So basically now when you're selecting the cases and when you're selecting the control, so control, it should be same as your cases, but only the difference is the controls, they're not having the disease. So in this, the comparison group, it is identified before a study is done. So before you start with the study, you're going to select your control. Then the failure to select a comparable control, it can induce or it can introduce to the various errors. So you have to see that whenever you're selecting the controls, though, so they should be like almost they should be same to your cases. Just the difference is they are not having the disease. Now, like which are the sources from where you can get to the control? So control again, you can get from the hospitals. So the people who are admitted for any other diseases rather than the ones which you're going to do the study of. The next one can be the relatives, that can be the siblings. The next one can be the neighborhood and last one. So the next source can be the general population. So these are the various sources for your control. Now the second step in case control study is matching. So what is matching? Now in this, the control, they may differ from the cases in number of factors. Now in the first step, what we have done is we have selected the cases and control, but now there are chances that your control, they may differ from the cases in number of factors that can be age, that can be occupation, social status, etc. So you have to see that an important consideration is to ensure the comparability between the cases and the control. Because if the controls, they are too different from the cases, then there's no point of doing this case control study. So you have to see that the controls and the cases, they can be compared. So matching, it is defined as it is the process by which we select control in such a way that they are similar to the cases. So matching is nothing but we are going to select such controls which are similar to your cases with regard to certain pertinent variables which are known to influence the outcome of the disease that can be age. So if the person is of older age, so obviously that will affect the outcome of your disease. So in that case, you have to see that you have to select such control and such cases which are having the same age. So that becomes your matching. So if it is not adequately matched for the comparability, it could distort or it could confound the results. So you have to see that whenever you're selecting the control, so they should be similar, somewhat similar, not exactly, but they should be as much as possible similar to your cases and main factors, they should be like similar only that is age because age can obviously affect the control and the cases. So now what is confounding factor? Confounding factor, it is defined as 
the one which is associated with the exposure and a disease and it is distributed unequally in the disease and the control group so confounding factor is nothing but a extra factor that can cause or it can like aggravate your disease so confounding for example now the person who is a alcohol consumer he can develop esophageal cancer but now over here the confounding factor is smoking so that person is already so he is also a smoker so that becomes smoking can be a confounding factor to your esophageal cancer so that is nothing but a confounding factor now what are the types of matching matching can be done in two ways that is a group matching that is in a very big group you can do or you can do a pair matching that is done like it is done in pairs for example a 50 year old mason with a particular disease as a case so a person he is matched so a case it is matched with a control so that becomes your pair matching that particularly you are doing one case with one control so you are matching one case with one control now what are the disadvantage of this matching so if the matching it is overdone it may be difficult to find the control now matching as we said that we are finding the control to be similar to your cases but now if you see like one and one factors for your control to be same as your cases so for sure you are not going to find only any control because no person is similar to each other so you are going to find some of the other differences so matching if you do over so you are doing over matching so that will lead to difficulty in finding the control now the third step is measurement of the exposure now what is this measurement of the exposure exposure is nothing but the risk factor so in the example that was smoking causes cancer so in this third step what you are going to do is you are going to measure the severity of that particular risk factor like you are going to ask the patient from how long he is smoking how many cigarettes does he smoke so that becomes the measurement of the exposure so this exposure measurement it can be obtained by various way so it can be interviews that you are directly face to face you are asking the patients about it the next can be questionnaires questionnaires is nothing but like your mcq papers so you are giving various like so you are asking the questions in the form of like in, on the paper and you are giving various like options below it like for example if the patient is asked about from how long he is smoking so you will give various option from 1 year from 2 years from 5 to 10 years so he will take whatever is right the next can be the studying the past record of cases such as the hospital record employment record so one more type of like obtaining the exposure measurement can be you are seeing the hospital records of that particular cases and one more like me measurement can be the clinical or the laboratory examination that you are examining the person and now over here the investigator they should not know whether the subject is in a case or a control group so that becomes a blinding blinding is nothing but when the investigator who is doing this measurement of the exposure they are not knowing about anything about that patient whether he is a patient with the disease or without the disease because now if the investigator he is knowing whether the case whether the patient he is a case or a control so that may lead to various error so because of that you go for blinding in the case of third step that is measurement of exposure and the last step in case control is analysis and interpretation so the final step is analysis to find out the exposure rate and to estimate the disease risk which is associated with the exposure that is the odd ratio now what is the exposure rate among the cases and the control to a suspected factor so case control study it provides a direct estimation of the exposure rate to a suspected factor in a disease and a non disease group now for example we are going to consider about the tobacco chewing and the oral cancer now over here 33 people are the one who is having the oral cancer and they are tobacco chewers and two are the ones who are having the cases but they are non tobacco chewers so now when you total it up so the cases are 35 when you are totaling up so a is when the patient he is having cancer and he is a tobacco chewer and c is when the patient he is having the disease but he is a non tobacco chewer so a plus c is the total number of cases that you have now controls are the one who is not having the disease but still they are a tobacco chewer so that is 55 that is your b and 27 are the people who is not having the disease and who are not tobacco chewer also so the total number of your control are b plus d that is 82 so now what is exposure rate so exposure rate it is done for cases and control so now cases are the one who is having the disease so it has this formula that it is a upon a plus c so a plus c is nothing but the total number of cases so now this is the total number of cases so this is your denominator that is 35 and a is the total number of the cases who is having the problem that is who is having that risk factor that is your exposure 
so that is your 33 so 33 upon 35 is 94.2 percent now for control it is b upon b plus d so b plus d is your total number of control so that comes in your denominator so that is 82 now in numerator you have b so the person who's having the risk factor but still he's a person who's not having the disease that is your b so over here it is 55 upon 82 that comes out to be 67 percent now what does that mean so it means now when you're comparing it so when you're comparing between the cases and the control so you'll see that the person who's having the exposure rate so who's having the exposure of tobacco will moreover develop the disease rather than the ones who's not developing the disease so for this now you can see 67 percent is less than 94 so that means now the person who's a tobacco chewer will develop 94.2 percent people will develop the disease that is your oral cancer now the next factor is estimation of risk so estimation of risk is the relative risk or the risk ratio in your case control study so what is this risk ratio risk ratio is nothing but it is the incidence amongst the exposed upon the incidence amongst the non-exposed so that will come out to be your relative risk so now what is the odds ratio odds ratio is also known as a cross product ratio so it is a strength of the association between the risk factor and the outcome so like if the person is having a risk factor so like how much strength it has to develop the disease that is your odds ratio so now what is the derivation of the odds ratio so the derivation of odds ratio it is based on three assumptions that the disease under investigation it is a rare one then the cases they are representative of those with the disease and controls are the representative of those without the disease so these are the three assumptions that you give for the odds ratio now for example over here the same example that we have already seen so now in odds ratio it is the cross product that you are doing the crossing of so it is like ad that is a into d upon b into c so that will come out to be 8.1 so now what does that mean so it means that tobacco chewing it has a risk of having oral cancer 8.1 percent time that of your non-smoker so this is the like the risk factor that the person who is a tobacco chewer he will develop cancer 8.1 times than that of your non-smokers so those were the various steps in your case control study now what is a bias in a case control study so bias it is a systemic error in the determination of the association between the exposure and the disease now when you're doing some study so there are chances one or the other time you can develop with some or the other errors so that is nothing but a bias now the case control study it has three types of biases so first one is the bias due to confounding so that means now you know about what is confounding factor confounding factor you can say it is an extra risk factor now for example if you're asking or when you're doing the study so in that you do not see about the confounding factor that the patient is also a smoker and also a consumer of alcohol so you don't see that confounding factor so that can obviously lead to some of the other error in your study the next can be information bias so this information bias it is of three types that is memory telescopic and interviewer so memory is now we have seen in the measurement of the exposure that you're asking the patient or you're asking through like interviews questioners whatever it is so now in this so this memory or recall bias is the patient they themselves only cannot recall so for example now you're asking from when are you smoking so in that case the patient they cannot recall from how many years they are smoking so that will lead to some of the other errors so that becomes your memory or recall bias the next is the telescopic bias so now if a question it refers to a recent past so for example you are saying so you are asking a question about the like about last month but in that the patient is also saying about like years back so that can lead to some of the other errors so that becomes your telescopic bias and the third can be your interviewer's bias so interviewers is when the person who is taking the interview he already knows who the cases and who the controls are so in that case what he'll do is he'll ask more question to the cases so the person who's already having the disease and he'll not ask things to the control people so because of that there are chances that can lead to various errors so that becomes the interviewer's bias that is the interviewer only is causing some or the other errors in your study and the next is the selection bias selection bias is now we're selecting the cases and the control so in selection is when you don't select the cases and the control properly and the next is the barkesian's bias so barkesian's bias it is it is a term which is given after dr joseph barkson who recognized this problem so in this it is also known as the admission race 
Now, what you're doing in case and control is now the sources were hospitals. So now the admission, when you're like admitting the patient in the hospital, so there are chances that the hospital people, they are having many problems. So if a patient is coming to the hospital and the patient is having many diseases and the hospital, they only write about like the major diseases or the ones who's having more of the problem. So hospital, they will write only the problems which is more major. So now what you do is now you take some hospital records also. Now we have seen about that. Like we are taking hospital records in our study. So that can lead to this Parkinson's bias in which the admission in the hospital only has caused some errors and because of that the study so your case control study it will lead to some errors so now what are the advantages and disadvantages of this case control study so the advantages are it is easy to carry out it is rapid and inexpensive then it requires comparatively few subjects because now you are selecting some cases and control so you know like who you have to select because of that it is like it requires few subjects and because of that it is rapid and inexpensive then it is suitable to investigate rare diseases there are no risks to the subjects then it allows the study of the different etiological factor because now in this a case control the disease has already occurred so because of that you can know about different etiological factor for that particular disease then there are no atrigen problems and the ethical problems they are minimal in the cases of this case control study so what is this no no like atrigen problem so now because the case control study they do not require follow up of the individual into the future so because of that there are no atrigen problem no atrigen is there are no like changes which has occurred so now in the cohort study we will see that the cohort study in that you need to keep the patient on follow up that is the major disadvantage of it so this becomes the advantage for your case control that you don't have to keep the patient for follow up and because of that there are no atrigen problems so now what are the disadvantages of it so there are problems of biases so we have seen about that the selection of proper control is difficult then it cannot measure the incidence rate like how it is like the what is the incident rate of that particular disease so you cannot measure that with the help of this case control study whereas about this incidence rate you can see in the cohort study that it do not distinguish between the cause and the associated factor like what exactly caused the disease and what are the associated factor with it so you cannot distinguish about that in this case control study that it is not suited for evaluation of therapy or the prophylaxis and the representativeness of the cases and the control it is less in the cases of this case control study so these are the various disadvantages and advantages of the case control study that was all about the case control study now moving on towards the next study of your analytical epidemiology that is the cohort study so cohort study it is also known as prospective longitudinal incidence and forward looking study so that was a backward looking study in like in case control we have seen that we are moving from the effect through the cause so in that the patient he has already developed the disease so from that disease we are moving towards the cause now in this cohort the difference is now in this the patient they have not developed the disease they just have the risk factor so in this cohort you go from the cause to the disease so that is your prospective or a forward looking so the distinguished features are the cohort they are identified prior to the appearance of the disease as i said in this cohort study so the patient they have not developed the disease they only have the risk factors then the study group so defined they are observed over a period of time to determine the frequency of the disease amongst them so because of that only you need to keep the patient on follow-up because in this cohort study the patient has not developed the disease so because of that you need to keep the patient on follow-up so in that why are you keeping or why are you observing the patient over time to see how the disease it occurs like what is the frequency of disease amongst the patient who are having the risk factor then in this the study it proceeds from the cause to the effect so it is proceeding from the cause to the disease so cohort it is defined as a group of people who share a common characteristics or experiences with a defined time period so cohort is nothing but a group of people who are having same characteristics so example can be age cohort age cohort is nothing but all the people in a group they are having the same age then the occupational cohort is all the people they are working in the same like field exposure to a drug cohort all the people in that particular group they are having the same drug so this is nothing but a cohort so the indication of cohort study is when there is a good evidence of an association between the exposure and the disease so when you can see there is a good like association that yes this particular cause can cause the disease so if you have that good evidence of it then only you can go for this cohort study then 
The next indication is when the exposure is rare, but the incidence of the disease is high amongst the exposed. Now over here, the risk factor is very rare. But now if the risk factor is there and it is going to lead to that disease, so you are going to like start with this cohort study. Then the next is when the attrition can be minimized and when ample funds they are available. Now over here, you have to keep the patient for follow up. So you are seeing the patient for very long time. So because of that, you need very high amount. So you need very like too much of funds for this particular study. So if you have that ample amount of funds, so then only you can go for this cohort study. Now how is the cohort study design? Now over here, so this is the basic difference that we have seen in the case control that the disease has already occurred. But now over here, the disease has not occurred, but only the risk factor are present. So in this, the study population is free of the disease. So there are two things. So when you're selecting the people, so they may be free of the risk factor and the people who are having the risk factor. So this is the present. So you're going to start with your study over here, over this present. So then you're going to keep the patient on follow up and you're going to see the outcome of it. So if the risk factor are present, there are two type of outcome that the disease, it may occur in that patient and there are chances that the disease, it may not develop in that patient. So this is the future. And if the patient, so if the patient, they're not having the risk factor. So again, there are two outcomes that the disease may occur in that patient who is not having the risk factor and the disease, it is not occurring in the patient. So this is the future of it. So now you're going to start with the study over here and you're going to keep the patient on follow up to see the outcome of it. So now what are the general consideration of your cohort study? So in this, the cohort, it must be free from the disease. Then both the group, it should be equally susceptible to the disease. So both this group, so the groups, both groups are the person who are like having the risk factor and the people who are not having the risk factor. So in this, both the group, they must be susceptible to the disease equally. The next like consideration is both the group, it should be comparable with respect to all the possible variables which may influence the frequency of the disease. So when you're comparing, so when you're seeing, so these two groups, they must be comparable. The next is the diagnostic and the eligibility criteria of the disease. It must be defined beforehand. So now what is this diagnostic and eligibility we have already seen. So in this also study, we have to define this diagnostic and the eligibility criteria before starting the study. So now what are the types of cohort studies? So basically there are three types of cohort study that are prospective, retrospective and a combination of prospective and retrospective. So prospective is when the disease has not occurred. Retrospective is when the disease has already occurred. And combination is in this type of study, both the retrospective and prospective elements, they are combined. Now what are the steps in the cohort study? So there are five steps that is selection of the study subjects, then obtaining the data on exposure, then selection of the comparison group and follow up and last is the analysis. So the first step is selection of this study subject. So in this, there are two types of like groups from which you can select your subjects that can be general population and the groups that can be readily studied. So the general population is when the exposure or the cause of death, it is fairly frequent in the population. So the cohort, it must be assembled from the general population. And if the population is very large, then in that also you're taking the appropriate sample. So this is about the general population. The next is the special group. So you can take your study subjects from a special group. So in this special group, you have select groups or the exposure group. So select group can be the professional groups. So professional may be like examples can be doctors, nurses, lawyers, teachers. So these are your professional groups that you're selecting the people from that profession itself. Then the next can be government imply or the third can be volunteers, the people who are like voluntarily coming in this particular like cohort study and the next can be your exposure group. So if the exposure is rare, a more economical procedure is to select a cohort of the people who is known to have experienced the exposure. So in this, if the exposure is rare, then you're selecting the people who are having that particular exposure. That ex So example can be radiologists, the people who are working in industries. That is your exposure group that you're selecting the people from such particular like areas. The next step in this is obtaining the data on the exposure. So the information about the exposure, it may be obtained directly from the cohort members. That is you're directly asking the members through interviews or questionnaires, or it can be through the review of the records that you're going through the medical records because some things it can be like collected from the medical records only. That is like if the patient he has gone through some surgeries, so that can be like collected from the medical records. 
the next can be medical examination of the special test that is like you are doing the medical examination of the patient that is the blood pressure ecg etc and the last method of obtaining the data on exposure can be through the environmental survey so it is used to determine the level of exposure factor in the environment where the cohort will live so the information about the exposure it should be collected that will allow the classification of the cohort member whether or not they have been exposed or according to the level of degree of the exposure so in this now you are obtaining the data depending on these two things like whether they have been exposed and if they have been exposed then at what level then what is the demographic variables so demographic variables are that may affect the frequency of the disease under investigation so these are the demographic variables that is nothing but depending on the area or location where they are living so that can affect the frequency of the disease the third step is selection of the comparison group so there are three types of comparison group that can be internal external and the comparison with the general population rate so internal is when in some cohort study no outside comparison group is needed and that is known as inbuilt study group so from the cohorts which are selected one member it enters the study and the rest they are from the comparison group so that becomes your internal that you are not taking any external source that you are not taking any external comparison group so that becomes your internal now external comparison is when the information on degree of exposure it is not available so it is necessary to put up an external control to evaluate the exposure of the exposed rate so that is the you are comparing between the smokers and the non smokers so that becomes you are like incorporating a comparison group from external that is your non smoker so that becomes your external comparison and the next can be comparison with the general population so in this when there is no information which is available so you go for comparing with the general population like for example cancer so the frequency of cancer amongst the asbestos worker with general population in the same geographic area so in this case you're comparing the people who are having cancer of the asbestos worker but now there are no like internal external comparison group so in that case what you do is you go for the comparison with the general population or living in that particular area where that factory is so that becomes your selection of the comparison group which are in three types that is internal external and the comparison with the general population now the fourth step in this cohort study is the follow up so in this regular follow up is required so this follow up it includes periodic medical examination then reviewing the physician and the hospital records then routine surveillance of the death records and mailed questionnaires telephone calls and periodic home visits are done in this follow up but now over here in spite of the best efforts a certain percentage of the losses to follow up they are going to occur because of the death of some patient because some patients they have migrated because of the patient who have like changed their location because of their occupation so because of that there are chances that the percentage of the losses will occur during this follow up and the last step is analysis so in this the data it is analyzed in terms of incidence rate and the estimation of risk so in this the example is so over here the risk factor is present and the risk factor is not present so this is when you have started with your study so in future you will see that 45 people they have developed the oral cancer who were having the tobacco chewing habit and five they developed the oral cancer even though they were non chewers and in this the people who did not develop the cancer even though they were chewers were 9955 so the total number is 10000 over here so 10000 is when the people who were having the risk factor and over here the people who did not have the habit so again the total is 10000 as the people who did not develop is 9995 so the incident rate you will see that amongst the tobacco chewers and amongst the non chewers so incidence rate is when you are considering the people who were having the habit and who were not having the habit but still they developed the oral cancer so basically incidence rate is nothing but when you are considering in the numerator who got the oral cancer so it is 45 upon 10000 that is the people who got the oral cancer upon the total number of them so it is 4.5 per 1000 and among the non chewers so five people they got the oral cancer and the total number is again 10000 so it is 0.5 per 1000 so you'll see that the incidence rate of getting oral cancer for chewers is 4.5% and over here it is 0.5% for the non chewers so this is about the incidence rate that 4.5% people will get like oral cancer if they are tobacco chewers Now the next is the estimation of risk so in the estimation of risk you have relative risk and attributable risk 
So in relative risk, so we have already seen about this relative risk in the case control study. So in this relative risk, it is the incidence of the disease amongst the exposed upon the incidence of the disease amongst the non-exposed. So in that incidence rate, we have seen it was 4.5. And the ones which are non-exposed, it is 0.5, so it comes out to be 9. So it implies that 9 times higher risk of the development of oral cancer in the tobacco chewers when you're comparing it with the non-chewers. So that becomes your relative risk that the chewers, they are 9 times more at risk of developing the carcinoma than the non-chewers. Now what is attributable risk? So attributable risk, it is also known as risk difference. So it is the incidence of the disease rate amongst the exposed minus the incidence among the non-exposed upon the incidence rate among the exposed. So over here it is 4.5 that is your exposed rate minus 0 0.5 that were for your non-exposed upon the like over here now you can see the denominator is incidence rates amongst the exposed again. So it is 4.5. So the percentage it comes out to be 88.9%. So it indicates to what extent the disease under the study it can be attributed to the exposure. Now over here you are like like seeing about the difference so you are saying that the person who is a chewer he is nine times like at risk than the non-chewers now in this attributable risk you'll see that it is giving the percentage so that means that the chewers so 88.9 percent chewers so there are chances that 88.9 percent chances are there if the person he is a tobacco chewer will develop oral cancer that is about the attributable risk so what is the difference between the relative and the attributable risk is so the relative risk it assess the etiological role of the factor but the attributable it does not assess the etiological role over here it does not reflect the potential and over there it reflects the potential and in this now it does not reflect the impact that a successful preventive or a public health program might have and over here it gives that better idea of that impact if you are doing any prevention so if it is like improving that thing so it can be given in this attributable risk those were the various steps in the cohort study. Now, what are the biases in the cohort study? So, one is a selection bias. Now, when you are not selecting the cases properly, the second one is the follow up bias. Now, when you do not keep the patient on follow up properly, so that can lead to various errors. So, that becomes your follow up bias. The information bias is not is when you are not collecting the information properly. Confounding bias is depending. So, you have that confounding factor, but not seeing about that confounding factor, same as that we have seen in the case control. And one more is a post hoc bias. So what is post hoc? Post hoc is nothing but a Latin word which knows, which is like after the event. So post hoc is like generating the hypothesis which is based on the data which is already available or which is already observed. So on that now what you do in this is like you generate a hypothesis depending on your observations and because of that it can lead to various unwanted conclusion and that leads to this post hoc bias. So these are the various biases in your cohort study. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages? So, advantages is the incidence rate is it can be calculated. Then, several possible outcomes related to the exposure can be studied. Then, it provides the direct estimate of the related risk. Then, in this, the dose response ratio can also be calculated. Like, if the patient he is having this particular like risk factor, so how is the response of that particular risk factor? So, you can calculate about that. Then, since the comparison group they are formed before the disease develops, so biases in this case can be minimized. Now, what are the disadvantages? Now, in this, large number of people are required, unsuitable for investigating uncommon diseases. Like, it cannot be used for rare diseases because in this, large people are required, large number of people are required. Then, it takes longer time to complete as it has this follow-ups. Then, the administrative problems like funding, keeping longer records is difficult in the cases of this, like, cohort study. Then, selection of group in a, is a limiting factor. Then, there are chances that the cohort, it gets loses, like, there may be, they, they can migrate they lose the interest in study, they refuse to provide the information. So because of that, the cohort, they get lost in this like particular study. Then there may be changes in the standard diagnostic criteria of the disease and study may itself alter the cohort's behavior. Then concentration on the limited number of the factors related to the disease outcome and the disease. So over here, the study, it is expensive because now it is. So in this, the patient is kept on follow up and because of that, the study is expensive. So these are the various advantages and disadvantages of your cohort study. And lastly, we are going to see about the comparison of the case control and the cohort study. So over here, you're going from the effect to the cause in the case control and over here, it is cause to the effect. So in this, in the case control, it is the first approach to test the hypothesis. And over here, it is reserved for testing precisely formulated hypothesis. 
so it involves fewer subjects over here as the disease is not developed so because of that it involves larger number of subjects it yields the results quickly because over here the disease has already developed and you're just going from the disease to the cause so because of that the results they are like you get the results quickly over here the results they are delayed due to long follow-up it is suitable for studying rare diseases whereas the cohort study it is unsuitable for it now over here the case control study it gives only the relative risk whereas in the cohort study you get the relative risk and even the attributable risk over here the case control it is inexpensive and cohort it is expensive and it does not give the information about the disease other than the ones which are selected for the study and over here it can give the information about other diseases also because now over here the disease has not developed and because of that you can get the information about other things also in this cohort study so this is the comparison between the case control and the cohort study so this was all about the analytical epidemiology i hope you found this video helpful thank you so much